All right, everybody, here we are. We are in episode four of Modern Drummer Concepts Live. We are discussing the concepts column from the magazine, but live and in person with another esteemed guest this week. Glad to have him here with us, and we'll get to him in one second. As you know, here at Concept Live, we take one of the past columns that I've been doing for Modern Drummer uh, for many years, or one of the new columns, but this, this week's going to be another one of the past columns. And uh, we discuss that with a, a, a guest who can give us another vision or another input on that. And we are going to get that today from a great, great musician and drummer. Check out episodes one through three that's been up here for about a while. Let's see, two months now. I think we've been rolling. And they are the second Tuesday of every month that they get released on the Modern Drummer YouTube channel. So our first episode was with Jeff Hamilton, second one Steve Smith, third one Dom Femulero. Those are all up and posted. And uh, and then we are here in episode four, so we're off and rolling. Today we're going to uh, discuss a column from the June 2017 issue. So if you have your physical issues, dig those out of the attic or check it out at uh, Modern Drummer Digital Archive at moderndrummer.com. And you can find the June 2017 issue. And as you know, if you're a fan of the column or Concepts Live here, uh, one of the things that I do for each one of the columns is I have a quote at the top. Uh, this column is actually entitled Building Confidence, The Right Kind, The Right Way. And our quote for this column is from Eleanor Roosevelt. Of course, I hope everybody knows who she is, a former first lady of the United States uh, in the 30s up to 1945, I believe. And the quote is about confidence, and it says, You gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You're able to say to yourself, I lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. And we're going to discuss that a little bit, obviously, in relation to playing music and to playing drums and um, what's required of us as musicians in performance uh, situations. But it is true. It is true. It's all about confidence building over a period of time, right? If I got through that, I can get through the next one. And how you build that confidence, of course, comes from experience and your ability to build a foundation in your talent and your skill set. So we'll get to that. And we're going to get to that with our esteemed guest, another one, uh, a good friend of mine for many years. I don't even know how long now. Um, a great drummer and musician and a member of the uh, headlining rock band Collective Soul, who's sold over 10 million records. I think they're 10 or 11 albums deep. And um, I love some of their tunes like December and Heavy and some of the other ones. So anyway, our guest today is Mr. Johnny Rabb. Welcome, Johnny. Thank you, Ross. Good to see you again, man. All right, you too. How's uh, Indiana treating you? Beautiful day here. I'm obviously in the dungeon. We call it the Fungin right now. But the Fungin. We, I love it. Indiana is it's great. Really, yeah. really nice. Good, good, good. And you just built that studio, right? I did. And if you would see around me, which I'm not going to show you, you would see Ethernet cables coming down from the drop ceiling. So we'll just keep it at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with that. I'm familiar well, with that. I, I built that studio at my other house for 21 years. I had that. And I got I got in the habit of not doing that, and then when I got the new place, and then having to do that all over again was like, oh no, it's such a huge job, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Good to have it. It is, buddy. It is. Yeah, and a guy like yourself, who who is not only a, a great drummer, but you you're an inventor, you're an author. I mean, you have two books, right? Or you you have the freehand book, and you have the Jungle Drum and Bass book, right? Yeah, that's right. That, those are the two books published. Yeah, and, and when, when you do those kind of products, uh, having done so many myself, you know, having your studio, being able to record all the play-along stuff and the tracks that or the MP3s or back when we did it with CDs, you know, being able to do the CDs that come with the book and produce that kind of stuff and, of course, do other side projects in your own records and do sessions for other people. I mean, I think everybody, everybody right now with the COVID situation – is going, uh, I should have built a studio years ago. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a, it, the funny thing is with family involved, obviously everyone has a tendency to say this, but we all mean it too, the family first thing. It's been tough to get down here, and it's in my own house, just because of the homeschooling, and we don't have to get way off on that subject, but 
I have been learning to try to be like, let's get the studio in shape. Let's let's roll off the XLR cables. Which ones were on the last session? Let's get this all tidied up. Yeah, it's been amazing. And my wife works from home right above, so the soundproof uh, proofing job we did was pretty intense, as you could imagine. Yeah, I mean. and uh, I'm digging it, and I don't think we'll be moving anytime soon. No, so. it definitely gets you cemented into a spot <laughs> once you build a studio. The other, I remember there was about five times I think Christine and I were like. You know, we could afford to move or we wanted to move or we thought we should move and went, let's move. And then I went, mm, no, no, no. Oh, just the thought okay. of even just getting the cables out and, and all the gear, it was, it was a nightmare. But it's great to have it. I'm glad you got it. I look forward to seeing a bunch of stuff come from the fungin down there and uh, you. what else you're going to be doing there. I know yeah. you got the sideband. I mean, obviously, you're in Collective Soul, which we'll talk about. But um, you have the, the NU80 band, right? The new 80 band. Which yeah. is really dope. I saw you whipping out the Simmons pads on that one. Uh, yes, yes. We that was a, all of us are just in love and grew up in the eighties, as you totally know. And yeah. uh, nowadays we're just we're having a blast trying to emulate those exact sounds on the kit, the samples, the triggers. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's everything from Mister Mister to In Excess to Eurythmics, you name it. And uh, and we're also doing a original record. We're doing it here mm -hmm. and. That's going to be pretty exciting, as you know, because I've got to work in your studio at the at the old house. That's right. Old. I remember that. Yeah. So I've learned a lot from you in that aspect, too, of seeing what goes down. No, don't get me wrong. I don't have like a board. But these days, you know, I'm, I'm kind of using I'm using logic, but got a lot of the like warm audio preamps and whatever. And we're just going to try like I'm an engineer. And now it's a whole different. Like I was just telling you, XLR is more than drums. It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. I know. And, you know, it. it but it's really interesting, and I've talked about this before in the columns, and, and I talk about this in clinics. When you understand what it takes to capture a performance, all right, so there's a couple levels to that, right? You got to, what does it take for me to perform a song in, in, a, in an artistic way that is capturing this performance that happened today for, for eternity, right? And, and it's, it's not about assembling a performance. That's kind of what's happening nowadays in music is assembling a performance. Where we grew up, you actually had to play the song top and bottom, top to bottom, right? So first is like just that, which is sort of a new concept to a couple generations of people. What do you mean I play the whole song top to bottom, you know, uh, with no mistakes? And then the second thing is you start to discover what translates on to tape that you can pull off live, but when you go to tape with it, it just doesn't translate sonically. Like some some fills, some things just, they don't, if they're too busy, if they're too rumbly, if all the things that, they just don't translate. And then all of a sudden your whole perspective of what you're doing at the drums and how it needs to translate to the audience through microphones, through records, whatever, it all changes. And I mean, you, you're, a, you're a great clean articulate player so i don't hear that in your playing very much but there is a lot of guys who you know you can really tell that they haven't recorded a lot versus guys that have recorded a lot well you know growing up in sacramento i like i lucked out at an early age doing one of those programs where you you're in a battle of the bands and it like forces you to go in the studio yeah so i had like one of my best buddies still today he was 38 when i was 14 so right. i'd go to his studio sessions and watch him and you're absolutely right he'd be on my butt about no 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 don't overplay no look you know so i learned yeah i'm happy to say recording to to tape as you did you know and i didn't realize it at age 14 don't, don't get me wrong i was like session ace at 14 i was just this kid but i'm saying <laughs> i'm saying it was neat to watch them splice tape understand what worked what didn't you know, and that was probably like 82, three. Yeah. And, um, and then pro tools came around. So it, I, I have to agree with you that some stuff does not work. I th think if you're doing a, uh, j more jazz funk record and you're going for it, I, I don't know if all drummers know this, but I know you do setting up the room to do that type of record. is going to be way different than yeah. a, a country record or, you know what I mean? Like Mike yeah. Wise and positioning. And yeah. so, and you almost have to tell yourself, at least I do, this is a like a vanity thing I'm going to do. I'm like, or if I'm going to do like a little chop thing, I'm just going to be like, let's do this. But if it's like collective soul or something, there are certain fills I did even like three weeks ago at Ed's, and I'm like, that that was cool. 
and he's like, easy, Rab. You know, <laughs> right, right, right. Like, calm down. I think, oh, he said, calm down, calm down a piece, but he's like, apathy or whatever. Oh, you know yeah, what I mean? like, Charmite, trying, yeah. He's, he's like, calm down, Carmine. <laughs> and I'm like, and, and, and that, I don't want to switch the subject, but over all those years, there used to be that, I had this thing of like, I'm not, you know, doing a ton, a ton of sessions. I think I could do well in the studio if given the opportunity, but it's pretty flooded. You know, and that, everyone's like, are you a session musician in Nashville? I'm like, no. Uh, everyone who's a session musician is just not working. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, they're like, I do sessions. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My books, let me check my calendar. It's empty, but I'm in demand. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> right. so, I'm not calling anybody it, out, by the way. But. <laughs> no, it's all good. I mean, I'm the first to just be transparent with this stuff and going every day I'm learning. And to have Ed, Lee Singer, Collective Soul, well, I do consider him like like a brother, but sometimes he'll come back on the talk back and I'm not bummed about it. That's a rule I've kind of developed. I remember one time, young age, you do that, and this is really young, maybe 15, where my drum teacher or I guess the producer at the time for one of those battle of the band things was like, do it again. And I'm like, well, I, I did it. I did it how you said it. You got to get rid of that, that <laughs> right. kid attitude and yeah, be yeah. willing to take whatever, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, and for a couple of reasons. I mean, one... Sometimes the producer has a bigger picture in his mind of the whole thing more than you do because you're kind of hyper focused on the drums, right? So yeah. he he might go in the big picture of this thing. We're we're not wanting the drums to occupy that space or or whatever. And then secondly, the engineer might be hearing some of those things we're talking about. You know, if you, if you got a bunch of 16 and 18 inch floor toms going and some bass drums with room mics, it starts to become just a rumbly low end mess. And, you know, so there's those things going on. And there's a lot of reasons why, not the least of which is they just might not want to hear it. <laughs> they might go, yeah, I don't like that. But, but there are other reasons besides just, you know, hey, don't play big drum fills or, you know, whatever. There's other things going on sometimes. And, you know, the last session, too, Russ, that uh, Chaney, the old drummer, was in, and we're friends from mm -hmm. the Collective Soul, was in there. And you talk about confidence. You have to, I felt like I had to, like, really be careful of, like, if, if, it, if a suggestion was made, either by him or by the guys, there could be some low points. You're like, in your mind, you're like, I'm really trying my best here, and I think I'm pro. Right. But then you have to realize, okay, any outside consideration is all good, and you can't take it personally. If you no. do... Or if we do, I'm yeah. not, you get it. It's I think you're dead in the water. You can really yeah. Yeah. psych you, yourself out. Yeah, look, if you don't want any um, uh, recommendations whatsoever, make your own record. You know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's it. Nobody's going to tell you what to do. You know? Yeah. I, you know, I think part of that is a little bit of the situation uh, that we touched on in the, in the June 2017 column. Uh, the column's about confidence and, and gaining that confidence through experiences. I use an anecdote of me doing uh, one of the Bob Newhart gigs. And mm -hmm. th that, of course, it wasn't really about Bob's book. It, it, when you do those kind of gigs, like I mentioned, you end up sight reading the opening act, right? And that's yeah. been everybody from Joan Rivers to Frank Stallone to whoever, you know, I mean, it just comes in as an opening act. And, and, uh, but this particular anecdote I was talking about, I look over and it's Tom Scott and Eric Marienthal and <laughs> Carlito Stiporta and George Shelby and Harry Kim and, and Doc Krupa. And you're going, oh my gosh, like what's going on with all these guys? And, you know, there's this, this fear of death that comes into your face. Like, you know, uh, oh boy, like there's a lot of heavy guys here. Of course, it's an important show. It's a big show. There's thousands of people there. And, you know, gaining that confidence you know, when you walk out with Collective Soul, there's 6,000, 8,000 people there. The band is counting on you. You know, there's no great bands with bad drummers, right? We always say that. And because the drummer has so much control over if this thing, you know, sinks or swims, you know, we, we can just tank the thing really yeah. easily. And I think a lot of young drummers, you know, one of the challenges here is exactly what we were talking about. Here you are on a session, you got you got the, the, the drummer that you're replacing, you know, the lead singer who's the leader, the producer, the engineer, they're all looking at you to, to do this, do this well, do that well. And it, 
it came from those circumstances that you had when you were 14 and 15 and all those years of gaining uh, that, that confidence through executing those gigs and having somebody um, actually say that works or that doesn't work, right? So then when you get into that situation, you feel confident to pull it off. And it's so important, I think, um, to have those situations because a lot of times, a lot of people now are playing by themselves, Right, they're they're playing with their playalongs and they're filming themselves, yeah. and, and there's nobody there going, you know, that doesn't really work, you know, or maybe you shouldn't do that, or you know, or they put it up and just try to get comments for somebody to go, dude, you're smoking, bro, you know, like, yeah. you know, it's it sometimes it'd be better if the comments were, you know, that doesn't really work for that tune, or you know, blah blah blah, and not in a trolling type way, but. I, I'm I'm interested to know you know how you feel when you took the collective soul gig and you're here you come you're a headlining you know rock star quote unquote and you're coming out to you know do those gigs you got to instill confidence into the band especially the leader but the whole band you know so that they, everybody feels like okay we don't have to worry about Johnny like it's going to be rock solid it's going to be cool you know what how did you feel when you you got into that situation. I, tr I tried to, it was 2012 and, you know, just a couple little recollections. I, it was very tough to come right in. We did not rehearse. The band does not rehearse. And that's not at all being egotistical or boasting. We, for some reason, we just don't rehearse. So when we went in, they've already been doing shows for 20 years. I was going to say, they've been playing it since 1992 or whatever, right? Right, right, <laughs> right. So like, I never forget doing the first, uh, it was more of a, a club tour or smaller theater venue tour the first year. And we had to do, which I'm happy about, but we, we literally did dosage the entire record. And then the second set was um, their, more of their hits. The hits and I'll right. never forget, uh, you know, for end of the first thing, I had uh, Uncle Cracker's drummer. Great guy. We saw Uncle Cracker the night before. Great show. And I never forget going, I'm freaking out. There's that little balcony at House of Blues. I'm like, wow, man, why am I know I'm getting looked at, you know, and mm. he's a good buddy. But I'll never forget going, you just have to do the instinct thing here because we have not done like the SIR or the or the sound check studios in Nashville rehearsal style right. at all. Right, right. And I just realized it's either do it or don't. And the choice was kind of obvious, like just do it. And there was a few, not train wrecks, just ending it a retard happened and I didn't do it right, how they're using right, it. Okay, yeah. And so then I got the nickname, you can imagine it rhymes with, okay. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. so I got the nickname for that. And that's another goal of like Ed being serious, but joking. And if I would have taken that, I have, a, you know, some very mo low moments like in the esteem department, you know, I'm, Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm a real, you know, that kind of guy. Right. And I gotta be really careful with, what I take personally or let roll off. So I've learned to let stuff roll off. You're right about counting on me. Um, there's only a few times within the band where I've had complete uh, brain malfunction, you know, on an ending or it just goes out the window. It's yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah. There's no, I can't even think about it, even though we've done it probably a hundred times or more, yeah. you know, the whole show, whatever, more than that, you get it. Yeah. But every time I've just learned Okay, it's going to happen. Like, for example, don't know why, but look over at, we don't run that many samples, but look over the SPDSX, the titles on the screen. I have blacked out or it's been, one song has been omitted, but the screen, you know what I'm saying? Oh, so yeah, yeah. That, you're about to, you're about something. ready to do an Ashley Simpson on. <laughs> so instead of it be the, the, the sampler thing, I had, I had advanced the title here. So it was on that in my mind. I forgot we omitted Oh, right. So right. I'm, a, I'm a song ahead. You know, <laughs> right, right, it, right. Gets, it gets introduced. Yeah. And it's a real drag when the whole show is going, oh, my God, I can't believe it. That's the worst thing, in my opinion, that we can do is go, oh, man, yeah. this is sick. This is going amazing. As soon as we start <laughs> thinking that, the train is going to do some weird thing. You're either going to hit the guy. Right, or, right, right. <laughs> Or, or, or count something off. And in this case, it was an Atlanta radio show, big outdoor festival, and it's the band's hometown. Oh, yeah, so you of can course. Imagine yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, and here's what I'm saying about the confidence part. I had to learn that if a mistake happened, and at this point, 
I've just had to learn, like, I don't think the guys are just going to let me go or fire me. You know, I've been told, like, dude, it happens. Yeah. Take this, you know, but, but here's the this best part of it. So I, this one had a cl- click on it. So I hit the tempo. Obviously, it's the wrong song. Right. But I'm thinking it's this song. My mind is, as a drummer, of course, I know you and I joke about my click experiences in the past, but <laughs> as a drummer, yeah. I know what's going on with tempos, but in this kind of adrenaline phase, I'm just, I'm going, unfortunately, by sight of the title. I just wasn't thinking, hit it. Right. It's, it's about 10 BPM faster, maybe 15. Okay. doesn't match what the real song is. I start what I think the song is. I immediately am like, this is a knit. So then I do, I retard the intro down and I'm getting a look of like, you know what? Yeah, 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 of course. Like. Now, I'm embarrassed, you know, and I'll tell you what, it was a huge lesson because we get done. The show was great. Crowd didn't really know. It frustrated me because I let the band down. We're going back to the bus and Ed just turns around and I keep this in mind, you know, the bus door is open. There's people getting in. Guests are coming in. Yeah. I'm beating myself up in my mind. Right, right, right. And he goes, dude, it's called a, you know what, and set list. Yeah. That was it. That was it. <laughs> right. And we go up the stairs. Now, me, I'm sitting there thinking, this needs to be, I need to drag this out more. I need to apologize. I need to. Right. This, this is amazing about it. Yeah. He said that, went right up the steps. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm toast. Oh, no. Oh, no. I walk up but the stairs. It's over go, man. Him. Yeah, I go, I go, it won't happen again. He goes, what are you talking about? And it I was, go, it was over, yeah. And he goes, dude, I don't even know what you're talking about. Shut the, you know what yeah. up. You're yeah. amazing. I love you. You know, I'm just, I'm just giving you a little feedback. I'm like, yeah. wow. I had to go back in the hallway, the bunk area, and just kind of take that in. That it was like, yeah. he let me know I, that, hey, I'm pro. Let's, it, it, reminder, don't do that. Try not to do that again. Yeah, yeah. But once it's gone, it's gone. And that, that helped, you know, the confidence level, I guess, realize, leave it on stage. None yeah. of us are trying to screw up, but there's going to be times that of course. it's out of our hands. Yeah. So, and, and I think there's a couple lessons in that. I mean, one, certainly the learn the lesson to learn is uh, to always remain detail oriented when we're yes. doing stuff to where's our set list? Is this order in order? Double checking, you know, and, and really getting in front of things like that. That's for sure. And we talked about that before in the column about giving way more than what's expected. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, they expect this, but man, it's so organized. It's so detailed. It's so put together, you know, that everyone is going, wow, this guy is like spot on. And, and I think what it does is it, it gives everyone around you that confidence into that 99 percentile, meaning 99 percent of the time, this is going to be spot on and there's nothing to worry about. We're humans. So, yes, there is one percent that could happen here and there. But when it does happen, I think the key to that and what you told us in that story was you immediately adjusted. You immediately had the skill set available to go, wait, this is the wrong tempo adjust back to that tempo, switch that off, you know, and make all the, turn all the knobs so we can land the space shuttle, you know? And, yeah. um, uh, you know, I think that's all part of it. And, you know, you had confidence in the ability to fix it on site in the moment, right? Because if you would have just went, oh no, and just shut it off and stop playing or just melted down that, that, and then the crowd would have known that it happened. As, as you said, they didn't actually, you know, they're not necessarily going to know. There might be a moment where they go, what, what was that? Yeah. But what was that weird? But, but that's it. Or yeah. maybe not. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that's part of what we're talking about, you know, and, and again, you know, I even mentioned this in the column, there's an expectation when you get into a world-class situation, which is what that is, is a headlining rock band. Um, there's an expectation of things being executed at world-class. I mean, it, it just, that's what it is. We're, we're not expecting it to be anything but that. That's right. And, and, you know, there'll be times where we, I just, you know, I'm reading this stuff. I was on American Idol site reading this and we're killing this thing and this arrangement and all this and we're live television and you get done and you're expecting like a brass band to come, dee, 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 like, look how amazing Russ is, you know, and everybody just, it's quiet. Nobody says anything and they just go on to the next tune <laughs> and you're like, your mind, you're going. I, I nailed that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I couldn't do this any better, you know. And, yeah. and but yeah. it's 
it's just expected and and that's just the way it is and it's part of to part of what we what we build up to in in our experiences and of course working and studying and building a foundation and the fundamentals of our playing to be able to do that you know w- one of the other things um that uh i i put in there was facing those fears uh gives you that confidence long term um you know the fear of something going wrong, but being able to fix it. And I, I've had some great story. I mean, you mentioned the click story. I got to tell that story real quick because Johnny was recording on the arrival record of mine. And, um, uh, we were feeding him the mix so he could start to play. And, uh, I don't know if I was engineering or somebody was, but he wasn't getting the click in his headphones. So we're playing the track, but he's not, he doesn't have the click and, and he's just playing along and he's just fine. He's just sort of happy go lucky about it all, but it's yeah. nowhere near, <laughs> nowhere near what we're listening to of the music and the producer's going, are you sure about this guy? Uh, I'm not sure about this guy. And I'm like, uh, Johnny, um, can you hear the click? You know? And, uh, of course, yeah. he didn't have it in his ears, but it was it was a good laugh. Um, oh my God. You know, one yeah. of the things that's amazing about your playing is um, is your your timekeeping and and the clarity of your subdivisions. All those things that are key elements to the drum and bass thing, key elements to the development of your freehand technique stuff that you did. You know, hearing those sixteenth notes very clearly and being able to execute that stuff in those styles because it's based upon machines, right? I mean, machines yeah. play all that, so their clarity and subdivision is perfect. Um, but I hear that in a lot of young players uh, that they can play a lot of stuff and it goes crazy, but they're, the clarity's not there, and it doesn't trans it doesn't translate over to tape, and it certainly doesn't translate into some of those styles like you're saying, like you've executed so well. I mean, can you talk for a second about developing that sort of stuff and how much you worked with clicks or whatever to do that? Yeah. Uh, from an early age, playing along with vinyl and those big uh, realistic headphones, the coily thing going down your Yeah, the your Princess ones. Leia headphones. Yeah, those are cool. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> early age, just trying to do that and into electronic music early, like craft work. Um, Devo wasn't necessarily electronic, but I loved their kind of quirky, you know, I love him, and I do Mark Mothersbaugh's movie. I just did. I just did his new movie. It's called Connected it, for Sony. Oh, Mark Mothersbaugh. Yeah, he's been doing. You know. Yeah. I've done I a should. lot of stuff with him over the years. He, those guys are amazing. Big fan of him and Devo. Yeah, for sure. And um, that's awesome. By the way, can't wait to hear or see that. Uh, I just got into imitating machines. I got yeah. into like Thomas Dolby "Blinded Me by Science" was the first kind of thing I played along to. Killing track. Killing. Love it, and uh, I guess. I wanted to imitate live on kit and I got the idea as you probably know, remember the whole Afro Cuban for the acoustic drum set, like the, the books and of course. Yeah. Right. So I totally got that concept of for the acoustic drum set, mm. definitely from those book series. You're right. And, so they're translating and, hand percussion to the acoustic yeah, yeah, exactly. drums and That's you're right. doing That's electronic right. percussion, right? right? Right. Right. So I was trying to like go, okay, well we got to add in all these claps and these, so I really got into it, played along, when, when Jungle was introduced to me in drum and bass, I literally would put the CD on at the time. I'd get sampling CDs and just try to copy the, uh, transcribe the beats and then play along with them. Yeah. And uh, that was in early Nashville days. And, you know, when you and I met, was in uh, Nashville in person, like at the whole uh, Jazz Institute or Nashville Percussion Institute. Okay, right, 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 right. Oh, you were, that was really always solid, but it was, I was like, whoa, it was really awesome. And you were debuting some of your percussion products and things like the wedge and different oh, things. Right, right. Okay. Crash course was out. The books were out. Right. And that was a great day in in time, like for me, because it's just getting jumping into the drum industry and trying to get no my name out there. And mm. Nashville was kind of the stepping stone for that. So yes. anyway, back to your question. I've always just enjoyed imitating electronics. Now sometimes it's bit me because I grew up kind of doing rock and. In, in California, it was a big jazz heavy. Now, don't get me wrong. I think if you saw me at a club playing a, in a real book, you wouldn't be like, man, that's horrible. But I'm not Jeff or yourself in the, in the jazz element. Okay. I, I understand it, but I'm, I don't call myself a jazz player. I respect, you know how much I respect you guys and, and, and Hamilton and Smith. And just yeah. So, but I really fell in love with fusion, funk, and like electronic and like this meld of stuff. So while I'd be trying to copy in the jungle groove, Clyde and stuff like that and Jabo stuff, I'd also be trying to do play house music, disco, right. and this drum and bass. 
And I remember one time you and I spoke at Mark Toberdorf. And again, folks, this is a, you take feedback in a good way. I remember Russ, you had told me, you're like, Hey man, I dig your playing and, and I love the accent. I was so used to out of college doing the chuck do chuck do chuck on everything. Wow. Down and I remember, yeah. I remember, remember you and I spoke at like, you know, dining hall where we were at. And you're like, Hey man, I mean this in the best way, but you might want to consider also reintegrating back in just straight eighth note and not so. Yeah. yeah. It took me years <laughs> to get back to being able to just do non quarter accent hi hat. And yeah. that, I'll never forget that. And that's once again, your subject. If I wasn't confident, I would have been, been like deflated. And uh, he, my playing must just be it's not working. You weren't saying that you were saying, Hey man, of course love not. it. Yeah. Don't forget this though. Yeah. Yeah. Of course not. And, and yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, story because, you know, for me, there was time I learned some of those things the hard way um, with older R and B musicians that I had worked with over the years, the George Benson's and the, you know, the Bobby Caldwell's and, and some of those guys that really would say to me, I'm not feeling the eighth note pulse. Like, and, and I'm going while well, I'm playing it, but because I was accenting the downbeat so much, yeah. you know, there's a difference between uh, a downbeat pulse with an eighth note inflection and an eighth note pulse. There's a that's very different, right? Because to get those eighth notes across, they can't be quite as accented on the downbeats like that. That's more of a rock uh, form of hi hat playing because the rock is more quarter note downbeat. So when I when I hear that electronic music or I hear that flow of notes that's going by with all you know there's a lot of action in that music. And yeah. and I like you know, the freehand stuff is a perfect example to be able to execute 16th notes at those tempo at those tempos with one hand. Um that's what's so amazing about that. And, and it's funny, I mean there's there's here's here's stories about where I said something to you but I mean I just copped that freehand thing, you know, I, I remember sending you like I play it traditional upside down, right? And, yeah. and I would send you, is this cool or is this stupid? <laughs> you know, wow. like, you know, it, it's so badass, man. Well, buddy, I mean, you're in that, in that book as that, that kind of hand. Uh, oh, gesture. that's right. That's right. That's right. And I guess I feel like I can do that stuff. Okay. But I'm a big fan of like learning it all. Like if you said, would I want to play brushes, how you guys play them? You know, I would you, you and I sat in the room. You're like, dude, let me, go over some brush stuff. Cause and I know it's like a lot of joking. We won't get into that total story right now. It's a lot of fun stories from Mark Toberdorf, but yeah, yeah. you, you helped me gain that confidence when we had a whole bunch of wizards on stage. And I kind of felt like, you know, this is not me. I don't want to fake it. I'm not going to pretend. And you're like, dude, don't pull, I remember, don't pull the cord yet. Let's meet after dinner. Yeah. I'm just do some basic stuff. And it was great because it's not like I didn't understand. I just didn't have, I just hadn't, been around brushes since for years and didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I wasn't doing much more than you, trust me. I, I you know, you know, I love those situations because I mean, uh, what we're referring to is uh, there's a, an amazing camp in Mark Toberdorf, Germany, which is in B Southern Bavaria in Germany that we did many years together. And yeah. um, a lot of guys would be there with us, uh, me and Steve Smith and Jeff Hamilton and Thickpin, Wolfgang Hafner. I mean, it just goes on and on, Thomas Lang. Um, and Johnny and I were there together. And there was a lot of opportunities. I mean, look at look at the Indian stuff, you know, with Ka Karuna Murthy, who introduced Steve Smith to that. And watching Steve, you know, who's an amazing student. I mean, he was on Concepts Live and we, you know, I always talk to him about that. I think he's one of the best students of the instrument that I've ever seen Agreed. Agreed. but watching him assimilate information and then it him taking it somewhere you know and it's and it's impossible to keep up with him because it's just it just man it's like a rocket ship but <laughs> the same thing with karuna with me it was like I, I was blown away by the indian stuff or i was with jeff and ed you know i was a brush owner before Mark Toberdorf, not a brush player, you know, Got and, it. and getting that information. And that's what I love about you as a musician is I, I've seen you grow and all these amazing things that you've done with your career. And, you know, you've gone from, 
you know, that guy who wanted to be in the drum business to really doing everything you could do in the drum business. You know, you, you did tons of stuff for Roland and Meinl and, and the books yeah. and the DVDs and, you know, you even invented the sticks and the, the tab muffler stuff, all, all the different things that you've done in the drum business, which has been amazing. And everyone at Modern Drummer obviously knows who you are and from all those things. But to, to, to cross over and to uh, be a, a star in the music business and, and with Collective Soul, that that that's a different confidence. It's a different thing of like, look at all the cool drum stuff I can do. Oh, by the way, I have to build confidence at, at, as a world-class musician with a world-class band and, and be able to do that. I think it's so important. And, and when you get to those situations, you start to realize how much bigger the music business is than the drum business. The drum oh business God. is, is tiny. And, uh, you know, and, and, and most people don't cross over. I mean, I'll, I'll go to contractors and producers and, and you can mention the biggest drum stars, quote unquote, in the world. They're, they have no idea who they are, you know, I don't know what you mean. But, but they know who Collective Soul is, you know, or they know that kind of stuff. I mean, but there's some guys who cross over like Vinnie Caliuta or Steve Gadd or other guys, you know, where you go, yes, every drummer knows them, but yes, everyone in the music business knows them because they've, they've been so successful in the music business as well. Right. You know, and then there's the flip flops, you know, where you guys, guys who are amazing band drummers who have done some amazing things, but maybe were never really taken in the drum industry because they didn't have all that drum stuff going on. And I think, you know, we all need to know that there's those two things going on and what the yeah. responsibilities are for both and that they can be come together and they can be separate and and, you know, what it's supposed to be on each side as uh, building confidence. But one, one of the thing, um, one of the things that I mentioned in the column is, you know, this, this discussion about visibility. And um, I, it's funny because, you know, I'll see somebody say, well, this guy's got, you know, 2 million views on this thing. And I'm like, yeah, but that band has 10 million records sold. <laughs> like that's real views. Like that's the view of the guy going into his wallet and buying something, you know? And I mean, I, I think for you, I, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your, your, cons you know, the way you're looking at that situation in, um, the development of the marketing from a social network standpoint versus the band and, you know, how much time of yours or effort is put into, you know, being a part of the band's machine versus Johnny Rab's machine and what that is. It's funny. It's a very separated thing. I thought it was going to be kind of hand in hand, but like I have only done one workshop or clinic. And I know that those days in my opinion have kind of dried up. Now I understand that there's, virtual things because of COVID and we're all doing our thing for like live shows and podcasts, and right. YouTube. I think it's very important to have YouTube presence and Instagram presence, but it's also very important to realize that there's life as also. And you know, I have seen some guys, and this is no disrespect at all. In fact, I'm like, whoa, way to get that many followers. But I've seen like lick of the day or crazy drum thing of the day. And I have the players, are, they sound great. Some yeah. of the folks I'm talking about. And I'm looking, it's like all, you know, 80,000 view, you know, followers. And I'm like, I don't have that. And that's cool. Um, what I'm trying to do is find a balance because I keep forgetting sometimes, like we did this thing live at the print shop and it was a legit live full band about three weeks ago, Collective Soul. And I'm like, this shows me playing with Collective Soul raw, legit. And I'm proud of it. I saw the, the owner of the, uh, company sent me a video going, what do you think of this? I said, here's shine. Listen to what this sounds like. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm more excited about that than doing a freehand post, you know? And, yeah. and, and, yeah. and at the same time, I'm not going to pretend, um, I have a little bit of a wanting to get my concepts out there. So this year I will be spending more time getting the studio legitimately going, getting better and learning how to do video and syncing and getting content out there. I do some silly stuff, you know, and I'm, yeah. I'm going to take a little, I'm not going to quit being silly, but I'm going to try to get my page and, and with this realization, like up and try to get more folks. But I really want to know, like, who cares? What I mean is, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's I, I would be OK if it's like 417 people literally give a crap about what you're doing or 58 <laughs> people or two people. 
right. rather than you have 27,000 followers and some of those are just following because, or some of them are lo- love collective soul. They don't really know about your drumming. They're, they might not buy anything of your drawing. That's not all about buying either. Right. Of course. Yeah. I'm just saying I kind of subscribe to that new, we all have a chance now. I know that sounds crazy, but like with, the, with can't with, with these, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We all have, we all have a chance. Whereas you and I, if I don't want to put words in your mouth, I was the dude watching Bissonette, VHS, DCI. I was, you know, Steve Smith, DCI, and, and absorbing it. If I had to stay home because I was sick at school, I'm like, Mom, can I, can I just run through these VHSs? Like, yeah, as long as you're not screwing around. I just back to back VHS, absorbing it all. Yeah. There's too much, almost too much info out now, and yeah. you've got amazing instructors, and you've got shitty ones. Pardon yeah. my mouth. Yeah, uh, that that's the real challenge, and I, and I talked about that. I'm actually, um, as we film this episode, we are in the, coming into September of 2020. Uh, the cover this month on for Modern Drummer is about online schools, and okay. so I'm a part of that cover story, talking about that and. Uh, with Weckl and and Famulero and and Don Lombardi and um, a few other guys, uh, awesome. but uh, one of the things that uh, you know was brought up ab- about that that situation is that you know we, we when you bought a DCI music video and Rob and Paul produced that of Bissonette or Steve Smith, there that was vetted. It was vetted, right? Yep. It was vetted by. I mean, Rob and Paul's not going to spend a hundred thousand dollars filming this amazing video, is and that's what it cost back then because we didn't have you know phones that had 4K video on them, right. and uh, and they're not going to do that unless it's like you know an amazing artist with amazing playing and amazing ability to speak and you know has got a following and all that. So you know it was Greg Bissonette, you know it was vetted. Anything that Greg said, I was in, you yeah. know because I, it's Greg Bissonette. You know, and and now there's this 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 huge challenge with the internet, where everybody has a voice. And really, at the end of the day, the great part about that is the percentage of people that were amazing that never got a shot, right? That we can now see and go, "Wow, this is so cool that I can see this." Or to be able to see videos of Papa Joe Jones or Roy, yeah. I mean, stuff that we would never have found before, ever. You know, there's so many amazing things that I've seen on YouTube. Like, I can't believe I'm getting this video of this gig I was at or whatever. Sure. And, and, but on the other hand, you know, as with everything humans do, they take advantage of it and mess it up. But, uh, you know, there's this other thing where it's just every single buddy who owns a camera is a drum teacher. Oh, yeah. And and that's a challenge because it's so unvetted. And, you know, you're going, I hear people seeing, I see people and hear people saying things on there that I'm like, that is absolutely not correct. <laughs> it's like just totally wrong, you know. And, and, and like you said, it's, it's almost like I'd rather have 300 people who get it than 30,000 who want to see me pick my dog's nose, you know. And, uh. <laughs> you know, and get, get all that stuff. But anyway, that's a whole nother discussion. I think it, I think it's the right kind of visibility that we discussed. And I think one of the things that you do that I appreciate that I try to do is I, I'm not going to film my lunch. You know, I, I mean, no one cares what sandwich I'm having. And, and then my wife's always like, you should do that. I'm like, nobody, I, I, nobody cares what's on my salad. Like, let me, I want to, I want to make like nice videos that sound good, that look good. Everything that you do, like I was watching, uh, you, you know, where you were testing the sound with, with new 80 and, and you were, you had the vocoder on the mic and you're trying to get the sound levels and it sounds great. And, you know, and you want to make it, I think we all were, we all want to make it great. Like when, yeah. when I see you do a video, you want to make it look like the DCI Steve Smith video. And sound like that. You you can't just take this phone and sit it beside the snare drum, and it's like, <laughs> you know, it sounds like, sounds like a, a a trash compactor going off. Um, I appreciate that about you. You have musical ears. You you know how to produce things, and I I think it's amazing. You know what you're doing on the side of Collective Soul, and and what's possible with that. I mean, as far as a production standpoint, and and you know the desire to do that. 
well, you and I have known each other and I've loved our friendship and relationship. And it's like, I love that the group that we have like inspires each other. Even if we don't talk every day, Yeah, I'm constantly thinking about what you've done in the past and what our friends have done in the past. And truthfully, I think about even Dave Weckl, for example, I've only met Dave a few times. He's been amazing to me. I know you're really close friends with him. I would be driving to jazz, the AM jazz band every morning, junior and senior year, cranking electric band cassette tape in my, my mom's Carmen Ghia flying down, running late as usual. <laughs> <Carmen to school. laughs> and, and it's like, I'm sure Dave gets it, but like what trips me out is back then it was cassettes. It was vinyl. It was uh, VH guest tapes. Yeah. And then yes, it went to CDs. But my point is you cherished Keith Richards solo album, for example, on cassette, Steve Jordan produced it. Yeah. Oh my God, it's in my cassette player. Where is that record? There's no going and getting a wave file of it and playing it through an iPod or phone or just streaming it or renting it. Yeah. And it's like, I miss that because now I have to admit, I would love to go take like Dave's whole online thing, but there that's, that's the fact. I'd love it. It bums me out that we have these masters like Dave. I want to shout out and go, do you realize what, he is putting online what you're allowed to see. If Russ and I could have seen this stuff, it's unbelievable. We it, would have crapped our pants. Uh, it's unbelievable. Out. The opportunity, it's like unbelievable. Yeah. I, I just, sense? yeah, I, I can't even imagine it. I was happy to get a picture of Neil Peart's drums, you know, let alone, you know, the videos of him playing subdivisions where the, where the music's down and, and he's up and, you know, all that. I mean, just all that stuff. Like, we're, yeah. it's just amazing, amazing things that are out there. And, like, one, one of the things that I mentioned in, in one of the columns uh, is that there's absolutely no excuse for us not to be historians at this point of what's happening there's so much information and amazing things that we were dying to get and that's out here now i and i just want to encourage everybody to you know utilize that in the best way possible and and to you know make sure that you are looking at what is the vetting of this and the vetting of that what what could this guy know or not know or it's cool to see somebody play something fast and i appreciate it and every once in a while you see somebody use a technique on the pedals or whatever you're like wow that's a great idea i'll put yeah. around with that but but like you said i mean to have dave weckle or anyone who's you know resided at at that level of musicianship for years upon years upon years to to give information is is un, unbelievable and and dave's like that too I, I mean dave's psychotic with the um you know the 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 audio of it all the you know and I, i'm the same way it's like i can't handle it it's, if it doesn't sound like amazing i'm like ah it's freaking me out you know well you and i both know and i know that you had your your, your own career in, in that same level you know we're all doing our thing but i mean obviously buddy the, the big rack and like i'm like whoa we copy we used to copy setups and, and i know yeah. we're talking about confidence now but yeah. i had to say that in 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 life now trying to be confident of like where where am i fitting in in this game yeah uh, you know i didn't miss the boat but i gotta be honest it was vhs here comes my vhs oh wait dvds are introduced man my vhs is obsolete now i'm gonna try to make a dvd oh man dvds are obsolete because here's the internet uh oh and now I'm, like, I'm still <laughs> trying to put <laughs> trying to play that joke. Like, and I have to be careful. And you've helped me a lot. We've talked as friends. I'm trying not to freak out and get bummed out if I see something that makes me either, quite honestly, upset or something. I'm like, I feel like you ripped that off. Or right. I'm trying to just do my own thing. And it's 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 a different world now with, with uh, manufacturers, yeah. with – Drum clinic, it's not how it was 15 years ago, where it was like, go to a music store, whether it's mom and pop or go to a chain, and have people show up for your clinic. Now it's all, I understand it's COVID, but it's all, it's a new thing. And I have to literally daily go, am I, should I have a studio? Am I, am I, and I just go, hey, hold on a second. Yes, do your thing. Yeah. Go on. And if somebody digs it, cool. Keep doing the art. Yeah. Why did I start playing in the first place? Because I loved it. So That's I try it. to remember. Yeah. That's it. And that. you know what? There's an honesty that goes through that, that, that comes through everything. 
and I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. But, you know, there's just honesty that gets stamped into music, stamped into playing, stamped into products, stamped into all that stuff. And when there isn't an honesty behind it and there's a little bit of a side thing of like, I'm doing this because I know more people are going to click like if I do it or, you know, so on and so forth. You know, it's it's about I think for all of us, it's about going, let me be it, it, people have said that so much, but it's true. Like, I just got to do what I think makes sense. Because anytime I've tried to do what other people did, it never worked. You know, it might work for a second, but if you just stay on what you're doing, I mean, when we look at you from orbit, it's like, are you kidding me? Like, you you yeah. have signature products, you have books, you have all that stuff, and then you're in the you know a headlining rock band. It's amazing, and you know what's what's a great what's great about that is I had this sto- I, uh, we we were in a marketing meeting the other day, and uh, for one of the things that we're doing with the label, and one of the marketing girls who's uh, really high up in marketing for um, some of the really big companies. I mean, they got you know 300 million dollar marketing budget like crazy she said you know we always have to step to the side and go what if youtube gets shut off tomorrow because it's just a platform where's myspace where's all this other stuff facebook and youtube could be gone like that it's just a platform for something. Another company could come up and make something way hipper and way cooler, and everything with YouTube is gone, and all those views and all that stuff is history. It's and, crazy. and it's going to be like, who's left? Oh, the guy's still making records, still making movies, still doing tours, still doing that stuff. So I, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I just think that there's a balance. I think there needs to be a balance. And I think that the confidence in executing the other stuff at the high level comes from everybody getting out and playing. Look at all the gigs that you've done over the years with all these different people. And then all those gigs with Collective Soul, every time you're walking out, 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 people, whatever it is, and the pressure of that, being able to execute it, that is so important. And, you know, just encouraging everybody to play music, play music with other people, with a band. When you were watching those DCI music videos, you weren't going, I'm going to assimilate this information so I could go film myself, you know, playing double bass stuff in my room. You know, it was about playing music. That's what it was. And I know that we are chatting about it, but a couple quick ones. I'm glad I had, we all had the upbringing that we did growing up when we did. I don't mean any disrespect what's going on now. It was all about me playing competitive soccer and going and, and competing in jazz band, stage band. And it was pretty damn serious. Like, we, you know, that our high school band was like, and I got to grow up in California, which you know, and it was, it was great. We were doing like Oakland Jazz Fest, Monterey Jazz Fest. Yeah. And there were no joke younger players that were going to be pro yeah. that we had to compete against. So my point is, I didn't know that was going to prepare me for a sub gig with Maynard Ferguson's big band. And you talk about, I just want a couple confident builders. I'm like, I am not. I've heard all those records that from Maynard and like all the heavies that have played. That's not me. But I had a, a, a opportunity to go do like a week or a week and a half worth of just dates. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I totally read charts in, in college, all through high school. Let me, let, me, let me do this. In my opinion, I should not have had that opportunity. But I, I went and did it. I really went and did it, saw the charts. I'll never forget they rented out, or they didn't rent out the hotel, let us do a ballroom rehearsal. And Ed Sargent was the tour manager. He's the one that gave yeah, me yeah. the opportunity to yeah, yeah. come in there. These dudes were ripping. Yeah. Maynard was ripping. And I just remember going, this is the hairiest <laughs> kick hitting, it, you know, just flies. Yeah. You know, on, yeah, on, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I remember. It's like the NFL, man. It's like the NFL. Oh, yeah. It was a little insane. So it was like, da, 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 you know, like <laughs> insane. Just like, where was that one? No, here we go. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I get through this one thing. And like you said, the whole, like, here comes the marching band going, good yeah. job, Johnny. You did yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. 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 It was this, it was. And I remember going, I totally, I, I missed that. They, they won't. It's cool. One. I'm not saying I only made one mistake, but like I, I missed a few little horn things. Just sight reading it. Lead, leader of the band, you know, Maynard's not there. Leader of the band, sax player, goes, hey, Johnny, measure 172. Watch that, dude. Anticipate. I'm like, holy crap. Like, <laughs> right, this right, is yeah. not a joke. It's this not, is not a joke. And I could have easily, at that moment, folded, 
and been like, uh oh, you know, and there's I never forget that week and a half worked out and got some footage of it. Again, I'm not some that's cool full jazzer, but I'm proud, I guess, that had that opportunity and all the training came through yeah. for that, you know, yeah. and then the Nashville days, and I'll just leave it at this. There are mistakes. There are counting off the wrong tune. Tanya Tucker turning around and going, wrong song, Johnny. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, you think you're you're going to die. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> nothing worse than when the crowd is also laughing at Tanya's delivery. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wrong song, Johnny. I'm back there going, brr. Oh, my God. Are you kidding? Yeah. Guess what? And I've been let go or replaced at a bus stop just because there yeah. might be some politics or – Right, right, or maybe, right. Maybe my maturity level wasn't there yeah. at the time of Nashville. At those, those moments, if you get let go for something or you make an error, just try to brush it off and have the confidence to yeah. jump back on or else you're – does that make sense? Oh, totally. Like just, and, and there's a lot of reasons why those things happen too. Sometimes it's not like you know you just can't play. It could be, yep. you know, this guy's got his boy and wants to hook him up or, you know, we want to have That's somebody that can sing or we wanted this or we blah, blah, blah. You know, it was really funny. I have never got a gig from an audition in my life. Every Me audition either. I've ever went to, I never got it. Me too. And, and uh, you know, it, it's just, I mean, there was a couple of them that, I mean, even the MD would, for one of them, called me and went, dude, it's your gig, but the artist wants this person for this reason, which I won't say, but no, you know, and yeah. And, and, you know, you're going, this is incredible. Like, uh, you know, all these other things I would get because I either did the record or somebody just, they would just refer you guys would just go, let's get Johnny. And then there is no audition, you know, no. and all that happens. And, you know, I think, I think those situations come, come down, you know, there's pressure in all those situations, like you said, but, you know, uh, I put in the column, Peyton Manning has a great quote about pressure, about, you know, pressure only happens when you don't know what the hell you're doing, you know, and, and the more information you have, the more foundation, the more uh, you've built one brick at a time and you're standing on masonry and not, you know, sand, on the whole thing. And, and it's the, you know, the three little pig story. It's, it's like, you know, I, I, I was really down on myself a few years ago and, and I have a, a lifelong friend. His, uh, his name is Richard Shirk. He's an older man. And, um, he, he actually said something to me. I said something to him. I, I'm having trouble with the fact that this guy that I know just seems to be skyrocketing. Like, I mean, it's just like he can do no wrong, man. It's like every gig, everything, every just skyrocketing. And I'm going, I just, he doesn't seem like he's got the, the foundation. It doesn't make any sense. And, 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 and Mr. Shirk said to me, he goes, why are you enamored with a building that only builds in one direction when you've been building one in both directions your whole life into the ground and to the sky? You know, so well, you yeah. go from the ground up. Yes, the building goes up much quicker. But when you go from the ground in both directions with foundation and movement upward at the same time, it doesn't go up as quick, but the foundation is much, much stronger and it can withstand all those things. And, and I think all those pressures, all those moments where they look at you and go, this has to be perfect. This has to be right. Or, hey, you hit every hit out of the 390 hits in that tune, except for this one, <laughs> you know, and, and I know, I totally know what that feels like. You know, I, I, I remember one time when I first started doing Don Rickles gig years ago and literally Buddy had done his gig, you know, I mean, notes from, you know, everyone, Roy Burns, everyone was in the book, like, you know, and they're, and the one hit had been scratched out and then put back in and then scratched out and put back in about 27 times. <laughs> and, and, you know, and you get to it and you're like, do I hit this? Do I not hit it? I don't know what, so I didn't hit it, you know, and the MD would turn around and go, you missed a hit on it, you know, and you're going, dude, wow. you know, but it, it, it's the same kind of thing. You know, you just go, I feel confident that I, I, I can do this and that, um, I have the foundation to do it. You had the skill set to go in there and read Maynard's book. And that's, that's amazing. Um, I've and, seen and that book. Know, and it was, and, and again, the story is not like, look at me. It's more like I, from the other great people that I've seen and heard play that gig. Yeah. That's not me, but I was happy to get a chance to, to kind of go like, are right, you thrown into this? Can you cover it? Yeah. Happy to say it got covered. It wasn't like, 
some stellar playing. It just was exciting to know that, like, dude, I, I did that. I could read this. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure it was great. Trust me, I'm sure it was great. Sure was. Uh, well, Johnny, look, I, I so appreciate your time, man. There's been a, really some amazing nuggets in here for everybody. And um, uh, please make sure to check out uh, Johnny's social stuff. And almost all of it is just at Johnny Rab, except for Facebook is Johnny Rab Drums, right? So, uh, That's right. Yeah, Thank Twitter, you. Instagram, YouTube's all just at Johnny Rab. And then Johnny Rab Drums for Facebook. We'll put those up at the end of the episode. And... Um, uh, again, check out uh, episodes one through three with Jeff Hamilton, Steve Smith, Dom Famulero. Second Tuesday of every month, we have Concepts Live being released on the Modern Drummer YouTube channel, and that will be happening ongoing. So we have some amazing guests coming up as well as we did today. And uh, Johnny, thanks so much, brother. Great to see you. Great to talk to you. Thank you, Russ. Awesome to see you, and thanks for having me. Yeah, Fantastic. of course, of course. All right, everybody, we'll see you next time on Concepts Live. Thanks for joining us. Hey!